members of the Ghana Bar Association, Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Students, Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Ghana's Premier Learning Society,
Professor Pong has taught and worked for academic institutions in the United States of America, United Kingdom, Canada, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Ghana, South Africa, Tanzania, Malawi, and Uganda. In addition, he maintains teaching and research interest in a broad range of commercial and business law subjects, such as the law of contracts, international commercial contracts, international arbitration, international trade and investment law, international business and economic transactions, sale of goods law, and conflict. Of law. He has published eight books comprising four sole authored books, two co authored books, and two co edited books. Very widely published in the field of law. This evening, he will be speaking to us on the first topic of the first day on access to justice in our digital world. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome 
Professor Frimpong Opong. Mr. Chairman, President and Fellows of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor and privilege to have been invited to deliver this year's JB Dankwa Memorial Lectures, the 55th lectures in the series. I'm deeply grateful to the Fellows of the Academy for this honor. The topic of my lectures is digitalization and the future of the Ghana legal system. As a people, we have become accustomed to enjoying the ever increasing benefits of our technologically mediated lives. In short, we live in a digital world, a place where engagement with digital devices, social media platforms, and online commercial transactions have become commonplace for many of us. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp, to mention but a few, have all become essential fixtures in our lives. As a result, we have been forced to rapidly adapt our lifestyles and interactions to the dictates of digital technology. Indeed, sometimes we do not interact with each other at all because of these technologies. In these lectures, I argue that like individuals, legal systems are not immune to the impact of digital technology or the digital world it has created. I therefore argue that as the Ghana legal system approaches its sesquicentennial, i.e. 150 years anniversary, it should embrace digital technology to advance its functions and goals. My three lectures proceed on the premise that digital technology has and will continue to have significant effects on the Ghana legal system in all its aspects. Digital technology holds great promise for the future of our legal system, but we must act and act quickly to realize this promise. In this first lecture, I will examine the access to justice deficit in Ghana. I will argue for a broader conception of access to justice, explore the leveraging of digital technologies to create new pathways to justice in Ghana, and examine the risk of digital exclusion. I will argue for restrictions on legal advertising of legal services to be removed. I will also argue for substantial investment in justice technologies and explore ways in which the government, the bar, and technology companies can work together to fund their development. In the second lecture, I will examine legal education and legal professional competence based on the premise that digital technology can and will likely transform legal practice and education in a manner that has not been witnessed since the inception of the Ghana legal system. Specifically, I will examine the skills, the knowledge and the competences that legal education institutions must provide for students in order to enable them practice or work in a world that is increasingly marked by digitalization. I will also explore the potential of digital technology to transform the delivery of legal education in Ghana. In the third and final lecture, I explore how digital technology challenges one of the principal functions of the Ghana legal system, namely its regulatory function. I will argue that while the state has sought to address some of the existing gaps using various legislation and policies, there remain significant gaps to be addressed. 
while such gaps exist in many areas, time and space do not permit me to explore all those areas that are relevant. Accordingly, I will focus on consumer protection in the digital marketplace and new working methods organized through digital labor platforms such as Uber and Bolt. These two areas are characterized by asymmetric relationships, i.e. relationships in which there is often a weaker party. I will argue in the third lecture that the regulatory powers of the state should be deployed to protect the weaker party in such relationships. The value of a named lecture, as in the case of the J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lectures, derives from the person it celebrates and its content. Thus, I would be remiss if I did not pause to reflect on J.B. Dankwa and my present lectures. Dr. Dankwa lived in a world that was very different from the digital one that we currently inhabit. However, I would argue that there are aspects of Dr. Dankwa's works and ideas that intersect with our digital world. As a journalist who established the country's first daily newspaper, West Africa Times, later the Times of West Africa, Dr. Dankwa would have relished the explosion of an ease of access to information that digital, digital technologies have unleashed upon us. Furthermore, a striking feature of Dr. Dankwa's social ideas was that in the words of Chumesi, he was not troubled by any notion of territorial sovereignty. In his obligation in Akan society, Dr. Dankwa writes, and I'm quoting, if all mankind were made by the unknown God, God the Father of one blood, then all men are brothers. And this extends the Akan idea of obligation towards all mankind, unquote. Like Dr. Dankwa, the digital world we live in challenges traditional notions of territorial sovereignty in many respects. These lectures will demonstrate that while the digital world challenges the regulatory capacities of the state, the quintessential component of territorial sovereignty, it also opens up opportunities, including opportunities for better administration of justice, which is another important function of the state. Some of my predecessors on this august platform have been able to regale you with anecdotes about their personal encounters and associations with Dr. J.B. Dankwa. Unfortunately for me, because of my relative youth, I'm unable to entertain you with even one anecdote. However, I will note that my association with the Dr. J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lectures date back to 2001-2002. Then a student at the Ghana School of Law, I was a research assistant to Nana Dr. S.K.B. Asante, a fellow and past president of the academy. For his penetrating lectures entitled Reflections on the Constitution, Law and Development. Little did I know that in exactly 20 years from that date, I would likewise be delivering these memorial lectures. Mr. Chairman, I will now I will now turn to my appointed topic for today, which is access to justice in our digital world. Ghana suffers from a widely acknowledged access to justice problem. There are financial, informational, and infrastructural barriers to assessing justice in Ghana. As a result, every year, millions of Ghanaians face profound and potentially life-changing issues without legal assistance. These issues include divorce, medical negligence, defective goods and services, parental and spousal neglect, debt collection, work-related problems, and rental evictions. With or without legal representation, people who make it to the courts in the hope of addressing these issues are saddled with delay due to the significant backlog of cases. Accordingly, 
the legal remedy for their causes of action often only comes after years of litigation and expense. Indeed, our former justice system does not appear to be designed to make things easy for the ordinary person faced with such issues. The complex language of the law, its procedural and behavioral protocols, the location of our courts, and the prohibitive cost of legal representation all present barriers between judges, lawyers, and the ordinary person in Ghana. Historically, strategies for addressing this deficit in access to justice in Ghana have focused on refining established court processes and increasing access to legal representation. Both are undoubtedly important. However, this lecture argues that meaningful access to justice requires more than access to courts and lawyers. This lecture argues that the Ghana legal system must broadly conceive access to justice and leverage digital technologies to create new pathways to deliver justice in Ghana. Access to justice is a fundamental component of the rule of law. It has implications for interpersonal and commercial relations. At both national and international levels, the importance of access to justice has been recognized in various instruments to which Ghana is party. At home, Article 35.3 of the Constitution provides that the state shall promote just and reasonable access by all citizens to public facilities and services in accordance with law. This imposes an obligation on the state to ensure access to justice for all citizens. Furthermore, in respect of persons charged with criminal offenses or instituting civil proceedings, the Constitution provides that they shall be given fair hearing within a reasonable time. The Supreme Court of Ghana has held that there are two sides to the concept of access to justice. In the words of Justice Adinura, the first is the freedom to walk into the court and initiate a course of action. The second is the ability to meaningfully and effectively participate in the proceedings. However, limiting the notion of access to justice to the court and court processes is too narrow an approach. This narrow conception of access to justice is often informed by the view that the courts are the focal point of the justice system. In my opinion, it reflects the mistaken tendency to equate access to justice with access to legal services through courts and lawyers. This lecture argues for a broader conception of access to justice, which not only encompasses access to the former justice system, but also all forms of legal services, including access to legal information, legal advice, advocacy, and representation. Scholars have articulated the need for a broader conception of access to justice. Indeed, as far back as 1982, Professor Galanta questioned what he conceptualized as the legal centrist model of access to justice. In his words, and I'm quoting, just as health is not found primarily in hospitals or knowledge in schools, so justice is not primarily to be found in official justice dispensing institutions. People experience justice or injustice not only in forums sponsored by the state, but at the primary institutions of their activity, namely the home, neighborhood, workplace, business deal, and so on. Professor Suskind has also argued that the concept of justice embraces four distinct elements, consisting of dispute resolution, dispute containment, dispute avoidance, and legal health promotion. According to him, access to justice should embrace a forum for the authoritative resolution of disputes. This would serve as a mechanism for nipping disputes in the bud as soon as they arise, instead of escalating them. 
It would also include mechanisms for preventing the occurrence of disputes and a way of helping people to take advantage of the benefits and improvements that the law confers. In Ghana, the need for a broader conception of access to justice is partly influenced by the fact that despite the well-documented backlog of cases, only a few members of the public encounter the former justice system. One 2019 survey noted that only one in 20 Ghanaians of those interviewed had been in contact with the former justice system during the previous year. Thus, Ghanaians appear to make minimal use of the former, of former legal proceedings to resolve their justiciable claims. Indeed, it is trite to state that people do not need a court or a lawyer for every legal problem they encounter. However, justiciable problems that find their way into the former legal proceedings are often long-term problems, which tend to be difficult for people to resolve themselves. This suggests, in my opinion, that legal needs in Ghana exist primarily outside our court system. Furthermore, a broader conception of access to justice is essential to decongest our course of cases that would otherwise not arise or which could be resolved outside the court system. In other words, a broader conception of access to justice would result in fewer disputes arising let alone reaching the cause for resolution. I will now turn my attention to technology and access to justice. There is a significant body of research to suggest that legal systems could and should harness digital technology to address their access to justice challenges. In Ghana, scholars and writers such as Mame Mensabonsu in Sankoma and Nanayao in Trakwa have hailed the potential of digital technologies to advance the administration of justice and improve access to justice in Ghana. For example, commenting on the first case in Ghana in which WhatsApp was ordered as a means of substituted service, Mami Mensa Bonsu believed the adoption of WhatsApp as a tool of the legal process to be advantageous and a welcome development. She saw it as the harbinger of cheap, faster, and more widely accessible justice. She especially noted that the decision displayed the sort of judicial open-mindedness needed to allow the benefits of the technological age to improve the judicial process in Ghana. The academic quest to infuse digital technologies into the administration of justice in Ghana has been merged with modest judicial reforms in the same direction. The High Court civil procedure rules have been amended to allow for evidence to be taken via video link or by other means. Also, a 2019 amendment allows a party to elect to be served with legal process or documents by electronic means, such as by electronic email. The use of video link and electronic services of legal process or documents is a significant advancement in Ghana. Traditionally, law, adjudication, and the legal system are associated with paper-based processes and brick and mortar courtrooms. The use of video link and the service of legal processes through electronic means substantiate the notion that access to justice need not depend on such physical locations or paper-based court processes. In addition to legislation, various initiatives aimed at leveraging technology in the delivery of justice in Ghana are worth highlighting. In one 2020 paper, Chief Justice Aniyabwa chronicles some of these initiatives, including the e-library project, the e-judgment project, the case tracking system, and the e-justice project. The COVID-19 pandemic elicited a rude awakening to the importance of accelerating some of these initiatives in order to forestall the justice system from eventually grinding to an abrupt halt. 
Indeed, the pandemic and the course response to it demonstrate that certain aspects of the justice delivery process could be conducted effectively via electronic means without the need for all parties to be physically present in a court building. These legislative and policy initiatives are important uses of digital technology to advance access to justice in Ghana. These initiatives are delightful to see, especially if we recall the history of unsuccessful attempts to leverage technology in the Ghanaian judicial process. In Chikata v. the Attorney General, Justice Sophia Kufu, now a fellow of the Academy, chronicled some of these efforts in the mid-70s and 80s to apply technology and sound case management to our court processes. Most of the current initiatives are still in a largely embryonic phase. However, one study by Banagman that focused on the Temele metropolis provides compelling evidence that effective management of the e-justice system would improve the administration of justice in Ghana. To date, reflecting the narrow conception of access to justice, these efforts at leveraging technology have been primarily limited to formal judicial processes, namely in the courts. However, this lecture argues that it is not good enough since the vision of expanding access to justice that is advanced in this lecture cannot be fully realized without the complementary leveraging of digital technology to promote it. Accordingly, I will now turn my focus to expanding the pathways to justice using digital technology. I'll press on. Expanding the pathways to justice using digital technology. The first point I want to deal with is improving knowledge of legal rights and legal processes. One significant barrier faced by anyone attempting to resolve justice problems is the lack of knowledge about legal rights, the legal system, and available resources to support individuals. Expanding the public's knowledge base about legal rights and obligations and the legal system represents the starting point to improving access to justice. Such knowledge would help prevent disputes from arising in the first place, or at least ensure their early resolution if they arise. In addition, improved knowledge of legal rights and obligations would help people to own and manage their legal issues. Towards this end, citizens must have access to information on the various state institutions through which their grievances may be addressed, depending on the nature of the grievance. The erroneous belief that the courts are the main avenues of dispute resolution should be corrected. In Ghana, the formal avenues for dispute resolution include the courts, quasi-judicial bodies, and administrative bodies. Aside these, there are many other avenues of informal dispute resolution, including traditional authorities, churches, community leaders, and family heads. To assist people effectively access these state and non-state institutions to address their grievances, there is need for the rapid expansion of law centers and agencies that offer free legal information and advice to residents and citizens of Ghana. Unfortunately, there are very few of such centers in Ghana. Also, the existing ones, such as the Federation, International Federation of Women Lawyers and the Legal Resources Center are mainly private institutions. This contrasts sharply with the situation in other countries. In other countries, law centers and law clinics within law faculties, private foundations and organizations, and government-funded organizations provide online and face-to-face -face advice and legal information to the public about any legal issues that confront them. 
Two very good examples are the UK's Citizens Advice and Alberta Canada's Law Central Alberta. The Ghana government does provide legal aid to qualifying persons under the Legal Aid Commission Act 2018. However, legal aid under the Act is very narrowly conceived. This again reflects the narrow conception of access to justice. In essence, legal aid in Ghana focuses on representation and legal proceedings. Generally, legal aid in Ghana does not or only modestly extend to assisting the public with legal advice or to providing legal information on matters that generally affect people on a day-to-day -day basis. Indeed, the current approach to legal aid in Ghana is mainly reactive. Wallace Bruce describes it as granting aid to a person in trouble with the law. He argued that legal aid should encompass education and other relevant information about the law. Legal aid, legal advice and assistance, as well as legal representation. This lecture argues for a broader conception of legal aid in Ghana. Legal aid must go beyond the state subsidization of lawyers to assist people in the courts. It must extend to legal advice on matters that generally affect the citizens. It must extend to the provision of legal information. Does anyone seeking advice or legal information on residential tenancies, debtors' rights, employment rights, consumer rights, or family situations, to mention but a few, should have access to publicly funded web-based uh, information uh, to assist them in the process. The provision of justice-related legal information that aims to inform people of the law affecting their day-to-day -day affairs and individual rights should form part of the core mission of the Legal Aid Commission. One of the most effective and efficient means of providing the public with basic legal information is through the World Wide Web. This is especially so in Ghana, a country where there are few public libraries and even those that exist are unlikely to have much, if any, legal literature. Web-based legal information would give people the opportunity to better inform themselves about the legal system, their rights and their obligations within it. It will also help demystify the law and make the legal system more transparent. However, to be effective, legal information must be geared towards specific and concrete day-to-day -day problems that people face. Abstract legal information will not suffice. For instance, traders need specific information on the laws that will help them apply their trade. They need specific information on their tax obligations and specific government offices they can contact to help them advance their trade. An employee would be interested in finding out about the rights that the state afford him or her as an employee, how those rights relate to those provided in their employment contract, and where and how to resolve disputes with their employer. The children and widow or widower of a deceased person may want to know how to access money in the deceased person's um, bank account, their rights and entitlement to other assets of the deceased, as well as the requisite steps to realize those entitlements. For these and similarly situated individuals, it would not be enough to simply post legislation or decided cases online, leaving them to identify uh, what is relevant to their needs. Regarding our courts, at the minimum, Citizens should have reliable and current information about the activities and organizations of the, uh, of the existing judicial institutions. Citizens should also have access to legal information relating to the work of the courts. This information includes the rules of procedure, forms and pleading templates, instructional videos, 
and general explanation of the terms which are used in court documents. Such information would be especially beneficial to self-represented litigants. This is because under the Ghana judicial system, judges are neutral arbiters. Judges are under no legal obligation to educate litigants on their rights or the appropriate legal processes to use. In addition, our civil and criminal procedure rules are not specifically tailored to self-represented litigants. A person who is representing himself or herself in the Ghanaian courts enjoys no specific procedural accommodations under our law. A self-represented litigant must take the legal procedures as they are with all their complexities and technicalities. Citizens should have access to information on cases pending before the courts and a searchable database of court judgments. This database should be appropriately organized and updated with new judgments. In essence, there needs to be a one-stop website or portal aimed at assisting end users by providing information on Ghana's justice system, including explanatory materials about the law, the courts, and the legal profession. In other words, the aims of the e-justice project should go beyond a paperless court. Demystifying the judicial process is certainly important. In this regard, I also argue that the live web streaming of judicial process proceedings of the Supreme Court should not be limited to politically sensitive cases, such as election petitions. If it is not possible to stream entire proceedings, at the minimum, every significant reasoned decision of the Supreme Court should be web streamed or video recorded and posted online. Citizens deserve to see their judges in action. After all, under the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana, justice emanates from the people. Furthermore, the knowledge that judicial proceedings are subject to contemporaneous review in the court of public opinion could be a powerful restraint on the abuse of judicial power. It is certainly one thing to read a court judgment. It's totally a different experience to see judges in action. I'll now move to advertising of legal services. It is essential to explore whether the restrictions imposed on advertising legal services in Ghana inhibit access to justice in our digital world. There is no gain saying that significant restrictions are imposed on the capacity of lawyers to advertise legal services in Ghana. The solicitation of clients, as well as general advertising by lawyers and law firms, is banned. There is also an outright prohibition on using social media to advertise legal services. The law leaves a narrow aperture for lawyers and law firms to create websites where mainly biographical and contact information is displayed. It would therefore appear that under the current rules, the creation of blogs and the use of live web chat features on such websites are not permissible. Lawyers are allowed to advertise in legal directories, legal journals, and other legal publications, but it is doubtful whether members of the general public in Ghana review law journals or other legal publications. These restrictions are often justified from the perspective of protecting the dignity of the profession, protecting consumers' ability to choose counsel wisely, and even in some instances, personal distaste for advertising lawyers. However, others have argued the existing restrictions are anachronistic in this digital age representing an unconstitutional limitation on the freedom of speech and perpetuating economic inefficiency in the market for legal services. This lecture does not engage with the merits of these arguments. Instead, I explore a less discussed aspect of the restriction on advertising of legal services, 
namely its implications for access to justice. I argue that access to justice is undermined by the current restrictions. The restrictions keep the public from being informed of the importance and availability of legal services. Moreover, the restrictions have constrained the development of some areas of Ghanaian law, especially personal injury law. As I earlier discussed, a key point, a key starting point for improving access to justice in Ghana would be making information about legal rights and obligations publicly available. I argue that access to justice suffers where lawyers cannot directly or freely speak to the general public about legal services that they provide or the legal options that are available in response to problems confronting the general public. A member of the public who might not recognize a problem as a legal issue may come to that sober realization through advertising of legal services. The recognition that a lawyer is required to solve a particular problem is an important part of justice delivery. In that sense, I argue that advertising serves a, an educational function. Social and other digital media can be powerful channels for such outreach. Restricting the advertising of legal services prevent people from finding affordable legal help easily to address the issues that they face. For some of these issues, people might not even be aware that a legal remedy exists. For example, thousands of Ghanaians die or are injured on our roads or suffer workplace injuries or medical negligence every year. Because of these accidents and oversights, families are often torn apart and forced to fend for themselves without a breadwinner. A cursory look at the published court judgments will reveal that very few of these personal injury, tort, or legal wrongs find their way to our courts for redress. By not proactively seeking out assistance for people in these situations through advertising, the legal system essentially asserts that people should suffer legal wrongs silently rather than redress them through our court system. This is especially so given the low levels of public legal education in Ghana. It is definitely likely that settlement is reached in a few cases, but it is equally possible that settlement takes place outside the shadow of the law. Consequently, there is clearly an untapped market here which lawyers and law firms must meet with sophisticated advertising to educate tort victims, potentially attracting them for redress. The regulatory potential of personal injury law to disincentivize the inflection of personal injury and negligent conduct has not been fully realized in Ghana. The advertising of legal services coupled with contingency fee arrangements that are currently allowed under Ghanaian law, could unleash motivated personal injury lawyers to secure justice for those who quietly suffer legal wrongs of this kind. The work of these lawyers and the knowledge of the financial consequences of negligent conduct are also likely to have a deterrent effect on negligent conduct in Ghana while fostering greater accountability in our dealings with our neighbors in law. It may be instructive to look abroad as to the manner in which other legal systems deal with advertising of legal services. In a 1977 decision of the US Supreme Court, the court declared as unconstitutional an Arizona bar disciplinary rule which prohibited advertisements concerning the availability and terms of routine legal services. In the words of Justice Blackman of the Supreme Court, and I'm quoting, although advertising might increase the use of the judicial machinery, we cannot accept the notion that it is always better for a person to suffer a wrong silently than to redress it by legal action. As the bar acknowledges, 
the middle 70% of our population is not being reached or served adequately by the legal profession. You are giving me a break. <laughs> As the bar acknowledges, the middle 70% of our population is not being reached or served adequately by the legal profession. Advertising is the traditional mechanism in a free market economy for a supplier to inform a potential purchaser of the availability and terms of exchange. The prohibition on advertising by attorneys likely has served to burden access to legal services, particularly for the not quite poor and the unknowledgeable. To be sure, in arguing for an expansion of access to justice through advertising of legal services, I do not claim that every issue with a legal component should be resolved with a lawyer. I also do not claim that everyone should receive legal assistance when confronted with a legal problem. Instead, my argument is that the public's lack of understanding of their legal needs and ignorance about the availability of legal remedies or opportunities for redress should be remedied through advertising. Advertising of legal services would improve the public's knowledge of the legal options, thereby assisting them in making informed decisions about their legal needs. Like lawyers, I argue that the Ghana Bar Association should also take advantage of advertising, using it to engage in public education campaigns about legal rights and avenues for seeking justice. It is and should be an important part of the work of the GBA to ensure that the Ghanaian public is sufficiently informed about available legal services. Removing most of the current restrictions on advertising who ensure that the public have access to a wide range of information and resources. Addressing this informational deficiency would help people to better understand the problems that they encounter, decide whether such problems raise legal issues, evaluate their legal options, and more easily access a lawyer to help them address those issues, whether in or out of court. As has been the case in other countries, I argue that the General Legal Council and the Ghana Bar Association could do this without undermining the dignity of the legal profession or leaving consumers unprotected. It would be sufficient, in my opinion, to regulate advertising that misleads the public or diminishes public confidence in the legal profession or the administration of justice and any solicitation that involves coercion, duress, or harassment. Before I move away from the topic of advertising, let me acknowledge that my analysis and recommendations in this regard may be somewhat controversial, to put it mildly. Some may argue that while such restrictions may seem anachronistic to progressives, removing them in the Ghanaian context it's not likely to unleash motivated personal injury lawyers to secure justice for those who suffer uh, legal wrongs. Instead, it is more likely to open the floodgate to legal imposters and sharp practitioners who pontificate as legal luminaries in areas of law without any basis. Some argue that currently, the restriction on advertising legal services in the era of constitutional guarantees of freedom of speech have not prevented um, the deluge of such persons on the electronic media. Removing the restrictions on advertising might well aggravate the situation. These are definitely legitimate concerns. However, I believe that within the framework proposed in this lecture, with sanctions from the General Legal Council to weed out the few 
who abuse their trust and taking into account the comparative experiences of other countries, these excesses can be avoided. I believe that even when the restrictions on advertising are removed, most lawyers will behave as they always have. They will abide by their solemn oath to uphold the integrity and honor of the legal profession and of the legal system. For every lawyer who misconduct themselves through advertising, there will definitely be thousands of others who will be professional, honest, and straightforward in their dealings. Investment in justice technology. There is need for investment in technologies that are aimed at making justice more accessible to the public in Ghana. The government, the Ghana Bar Association, and technology companies have a responsibility to help develop digital solutions towards this end. A significant development in some African countries, as well as in jurisdictions such as Canada, the UK, and the USA, is the emergence of justice technology companies. These are organizations with tech-driven products that are designed to help people who are impacted by the justice system. These organizations have developed applications websites, and other digital tools to expand access to legal resources and representation. These tools have helped people to undertake legal transactions, including the incorporation of companies, making wills, drafting, and execution of contracts. These tools have also helped people to improve knowledge and understanding of their respective legal systems. At present, a few Ghanaian companies are developing technologies related to the justice system. These include Dennis Law and Data Center. However, to date, their products have focused mainly on the legal commercial market with the goal of enabling legal professionals to enhance and better manage their commercial legal service offering. The broader purpose of improving access to justice for the ordinary man in Ghana remains subsidiary. There are definitely a few exceptions, including Justice Locator and Mary Wright, both developed by Dennis Law, and the Boame app, which is also worth mentioning. Private capital is definitely essential to justice technology investment. However, I argue that private capital tends to focus on return on investment. Thus, private capital is more commercially minded. It is less focused on access to justice. As a result, the broader public good of advancing access to justice may be insufficient to spare investment in this area. Accordingly, direct government investment in justice technology is necessary. This lecture advo has advocated establishing a single unified national legal portal with supporting app, providing access to Ghanaian laws, judicial decisions, and relevant information on access to justice. Funding for this national portal in Ghana should come from the government and the members of the Ghana Bar Association. I argue that a potential source of such funding for investment could be the interest that accrue on funds that clients deposit with lawyers when lawyers are providing them with legal services. At present, the interest that accrue on such funds is not regulated, legally regulated. The lawyer and the client are free to decide what happens to the interest. Also, depending on the account that the funds are deposited in, banks get sizable interest-free loans when lawyers deposit such funds in with the banks. In other countries, the interests that accrue on client funds have been used to advance various objectives, including access to justice. These countries include the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. In one US Supreme Court decision, the court noted the dramatic success of the program in serving the compelling interest of providing legal services to millions of needy Americans. In British Columbia, 
the interest paid by financial institution some funds held in lawyers' trust account is paid to the Law Foundation of British Columbia. Law firms are required to instruct their banks to remit those funds directly to the Law Foundation. The Law Foundation is a non-governmental organization created by legislation, and it uses those funds for various initiatives, including legal research, legal aid, legal reform, and scholarships. Indeed, my doctoral studies at the University of British Columbia was partly funded with a scholarship from the Law Foundation. In addition to financial investment, creating a favorable regulatory environment for justice tech apps to operate is crucial. Given the levels of legal education and the levels of literacy in Ghana, I should emphasize that investments in justice tech applications and web-based legal information should not be limited solely to the English language. There must be concerted efforts to develop apps that are inclusive in all respects. That is, apps that are accessible to all, including the illiterate and persons with disabilities. As far back as 1976, Professor F.T. Sai noted in his J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lectures that technology should be concerned about all the people, unquote. This lecture's emphasis on digital solutions should not be construed as denigrating, denigrating or diminishing the importance of time-tested methods of improving access to justice. These include radio and television shows, newspaper columns, well-resourced public libraries that stock legal materials, and academic law libraries. For example, Generations of Ghanaians have benefited from the long-running Mirror Lawyer column in the Mirror, as well as Radio Lawyer on DBC. We must continue to invest in these time-tested methods of improving access to justice. Digital technologies could amplify the reach of these traditional methods and facilitate access to legal information that they provide. The risk of digital technologies. <coughs> Admittedly, although digital technologies can advance access to justice, digitalization of the means of access to justice is accompanied by various risks, which should be articulated and guarded against. In deploying technology in the courts and in civil procedures, the focus tends to be on the gains in efficiency and effectiveness that flow from this deployment. Very often, the socio-political and cultural implications of relying on digital technologies are not clearly articulated. Similarly, while digital technologies can make legal information and advice more accessible, they can also create a gulf between the haves and the have-not. There is a real risk of excluding the digitally illiterate or the digitally under-resourced including those who do not have access to relevant facilities such as the internet. This risk derives from a broader recognition that the socioeconomic factors affecting citizens also affect their ability to benefit from initiatives designed to improve access to justice. Without attention to these socioeconomic factors, there is the distinct possibility that access to justice initiatives can entrench disparities in the process of delivering justice. Citizens can only make effective use of digital technologies that are deployed to facilitate access to justice if they have digital access and digital literacy. Conversely, if someone is not digitally literate, does not have access to digital device, or has poor internet connection, the promise of greater access to justice through digital means will remain an illusion. Given these challenges, there is a definite need to avoid a situation where digital expansion and the digital way of doing things become the norm in Ghana without supplementary paper-based or face-to-face uh, -face engagement. Indeed, it should always be recognized that there are certain segments of society 
for whom digital means are not appropriate. In the discerning words of Professor Roger Smith, we need to consider that there will be a percentage of every population in every country which will not be able to take advantage of digital means of communication. And for them, there need to be alternatives. Mr. Chairman, I will now turn to my conclusion. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, President and Fellows of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen, this lecture has advocated an expanded vision of access to justice in Ghana. I have argued that we should see access to justice as something broader than access to court and lawyers. In fact, access to justice should encompass access to the justice system and all forms of legal services, including access to legal information and legal advice, advocacy, and representation. To realize the benefit of this wider vision of access to justice, the message of this lecture has been a simple one. The Ghana legal system should embrace digital technologies that can help it provide better justice to Ghanaians. The use of digital technology to overcome social ills has been well documented and Ghana is no, not alien to this. The expansion of financial inclusion through digital technologies demonstrates the potential for such technologies to transform or enhance access to justice. In Ghana, many people have been able to participate in the financial system through mobile electronic wallets, which store money and enable money, electronic money transfers. This lecture calls us to reflect on whether something similar could be achieved regarding access to justice. This lecture calls on the General Legal Council, the Ghana Bar Association, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice to jointly work and commission a study on access to justice in Ghana. The commission should, among other things, examine the use of digital technologies to enhance access to justice. The commission should also consider the prospect of adopting an interest on lawyers trust account scheme to fund access to justice initiatives in Ghana. The GBA and the General Legal Council should revisit the current restrictions on advertising of legal services with a view to adopting a regime that better mediates the interest of access to justice, protect the integrity of the legal profession and prevent abuse. Finally, this lecture calls for a national legal technology vision to complement the government's drive to develop a digitalized economy. The realization of this vision will definitely demand close collaboration between the government, the General Legal Council, the Ghana Bar Association, and technology companies. In the second lecture, which is tomorrow, I will turn my attention to legal education and legal professional competence and how we can train students for our digital world. Thank you. Let's give him a hand again for this very brilliant lecture. Our lecturer has given us a broad understanding of the first topic, the first day. He raised several issues for our consideration, and I will just pick a few to summarize. He raised the matter of access to justice deficit in Ghana. And he's repeated several times that this is more than the courts and lawyers. He also raised the matter of creating a broader conception of access to justice instead of a very narrow conception. Leveraging the digital technologies to create new pathways to justice in Ghana. The example he gave was the live streaming of proceedings. And he said this should not be limited to the 
politically interesting areas, but it should be made normal if it is possible. He talked about the risk of digital exclusion. And this is something that we should reflect on as we move on the path of digitization. Are we excluding some citizens in the process? And how do we tackle that exclusion? Another area which he mentioned as possibly controversial is the removal of restrictions on advertising of legal services, a matter which he raised to create awareness that maybe we could do things differently as we look at the changing trends in the world. He also mentioned the issue of investments, investments in justice technologies that will make the work in the legal system better and help all of us. And I like his quotation of the late Professor Sai's 1976 J.B. Dankwa lecture. Technology should be concerned about all the people. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for those uh, closing remarks. And with that, we have come to the end of day one of this three-day event marking the 55th in the J.B. Dankwa Lectures series. But before we leave, I'd like to acknowledge the schools represented here. A School of Law, University of Ghana, School of Law, University of Professional Studies, Accra. The Accra College of Education, Accra Wesley Girls, Accra Technical Training College, and Presbyterian Secondary High School, Presec Legon. Shall we give them a big round of applause? We thank you very much for your presence here this evening. Tomorrow, we will have the second lecture to be delivered by Professor Richard Frimpong Opong. And the topic for tomorrow's lecture is legal education and professional competence in our digital world. Legal education and professional competence in our digital world. It will be delivered at the same time, 5.30 p.m. here in the auditorium and online together with live streaming. Please make the time to attend this lecture tomorrow. Now, uh, there, we will have refreshments, but there will be no, no sitting. Um, there are packed 
refreshments for everyone. And uh, all we have to do is uh, pick up a bag in the foyer as we leave this uh, auditorium. Thank you very much. May I now ask you to stand while I escort the speaker and the chairman out. Thank you.